the last time is we uh, were looking at the central notion of the idea of a family, a type index, let me write it like this, the central notion of a type indexed uh, family uh, of types. This is a central idea of dependent type theory. Okay, and we could write this down in various ways. For example, we can think of the family of types, let's write this B, B of X, where X sort of ranges over some other type A. That's a typical sort of notation you might see that looks uh, like conventional uh, notation for a family of sets. So this would be a set index family of sets. Or as we'll tend to write this, we'll say, given X and A, we'll say that B, sometimes I'll emphasize that there's an X there or not according to the situation, but it's a family of types. And we can think of this as a kind of mapping. We can think of this as something that assigns to each M in A. It turns it into its substitution instance, which is a particular type. Okay, so this is going to be a type. So it sends every element of A to a type. And moreover, this principle of reflection, or excuse me, of respect for equality or functionality says if we have, let's call it M and N, if we have equal index elements, at least definitionally equal index elements, then those should induce uh, definitionally equal types. Okay, so this is, uh, so these would be equal as types. And this notion, this idea of respect for equality here, is called functionality. Uh, is a typical, uh, typical, uh, typical term for this. It's the idea that the relationship is functional, meaning that it sends equal arguments to equal results. Okay, uh, so an, or another way of saying it is, we cannot formulate a family of types that distinguishes between definitionally equivalent indices. Okay, that's a that's a, another way of saying it. So, <coughs> a fam so if a, so if I had, for example, a family of types, we talked to we talked last time about this is not working too well. Um, we talked, uh, see whether that works. <coughs> Get this out of the way. Uh, we talk about uh, a family of types like, oh, one, one thing might be the sequences of length n. So let's say if we have the natural numbers, then I might talk about the sequences of length n. Uh, the sequences, let's say, of natural numbers, just to be like as uh, minimalistic about this as I can think of. So this might be a family of types. And so we're expecting, for example, so for example, based on our preceding discussion, that we would say that the types, you know, a sequence of length 2 plus 2 would be the same type as a sequence of length 1 plus 3, maybe. Okay? That would be the same. And in particular, they classify the same terms. Okay? So therefore, they classify the same terms. <coughs> okay, so that's, uh, that's an example. So that's a, the notion of what func functionality is all about. So there's this respect for equality. So in order to, so what we see here is in order to even get this discussion going and to talk about these things, I needed to uh, have a variety of, of notions, okay? And the notions I needed are, I have the notion of a context, I have the notion of a type in a context. So this is the, for the sake of the induction, by which I mean we can have iterated dependencies. So for example, I could, <coughs> I could have, uh, given a family of types B like this, I could then talk about a doubly indexed family of types. And then <coughs> just to be emphatic, I can put an X here <coughs> to indicate that this is dependent. <coughs> and I can have C with X and Y being a type. And that would be a doubly indexed uh, family of types. So it's, uh, it's indexed by elements of A and then by elements of B for that element of A, okay, so that it's iterated in this manner and so forth. So for the sake of the induction, we have in general a context, all right, a, br a bunch of variables here, and we have types that are dependent on those variables. So this is the idea of a family of types. And then we have the classification of terms of a particular type looking like this. And then correspondingly, we needed notions of definitional equality. And our starting point was definitional equality of elements of a type. So I motivated the whole discussion by saying, well, even when we have only, uh, when we don't have dependent types, when we have only, only um, 
uh, uh, s simple types that without any dependency is nevertheless interesting to talk about the equivalences between proofs of a particular type, but that this concept becomes particularly significant as soon as we allow dependency for the very reason of the principles that I was mentioning here. So that then induces notions of definitional equality of types. Sometimes I'll write type here and sometimes I won't. Okay, and then that in itself pointwise it induces a notion of definitional equivalence of context. Okay, so we have uh, kind of the, the formations and the equivalences written like this. <clears throat> now, for uh, when people study formalisms for type theory, they'll often play subtle little games and tricks with these things to uh, economize on the formulation. So I would rather not do that here because it, 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 it can be mathematically handy to do that, but it's uh, pedagogically not very helpful. Because, for example, you could think of membership as being defined by the reflexive instance of equality, and then you can kind of get away with only defining equality. But that's a little like too clever by half sort of thing. And so I'll just sort of stick with, uh, we'll still stick with a, a more, uh, I think, intuitively clear formulation, even though I admit that certain kinds of uh, e e econom economies uh, can be introduced, and people do do them in the, in the do introduce them in the literature, usually for meta theoretic reasons. <clears throat> okay, so that's the, the basic setup. And the kind of thing that you should keep in mind for the time being at the moment is the notion of like a family of types, like for example, the sequences of numbers of a, of a given, of a specified length, <clears throat> or other such, uh, or various things like relations, things that come up as predicates or relations. So for example, writing MN in the natural numbers, we could have some idea of equality of M and N which I will uh, come back to uh, in more detail later, which would be a type. And the way to think of that is it's the type of proofs that M and N are equal. Now, in the case of the natural numbers, be because we tend to think of the natural numbers in the terminology I will use, we tend to think of them as a set, meaning that the elements are discrete. They're, they're uh, just sort of points, uh, isolated points in this, uh, in this space, if you like to think of it that way. And so what's going to happen is the types that are being considered here are basically either empty or contain one element. That is, the fact that they're, that they're equal is an instance of reflexivity, and if they're different, then they're different and there's no element of that type. But I, it's nevertheless important to think in terms of it's the type of proofs that they're equal, even in the cases where the proofs may be, uh, may be non-trivial or you know, maybe trivial. In this case, they may be quite trivial. But even so, we want to think of that as the type of its proofs. And there could be other things. There could be proofs of other relationships less than or equal to and so on. So in general, you know, this sort of thing represents a kind of, you can think of it simultaneously as a relation or as a predicate or as a family of types or as I mentioned before, as a vibration, as this kind of other sort of structure where you think of this as being some kind of big disjoint union of all, you take all of the, for each X and A, you sort of union up all the little B sub A's and then you look at the things that are over a particular A. So if you look at, if you just use some set theoretic notation, if you form like some sort of big disjoint union, sorry about the pen, where A is in A over B sub A, right? So there's this big fat union we'll call that B, right? Then we'll define that. Then there's a natural projection, P, which goes down onto A. And what it does is for each element in this big disjoint union, it tells you which A does it sit over, okay? The pr projection is over which A is it? So if I give you an element of the big, the big clump, right, this big the so-called total space. Sorry, uh, can someone help me with the pen here? This is not working out very well. <coughs> uh, okay. So if you take the, what is called the total space, then this P, this projection here, is telling us over which element we sit because you can think of these elements of this disjoint union as being like A and B, where B is in B sub A. And then, as I mentioned last time, if you look at the inverse image, if you take any particular A and you look at where it is sent under the, the pre-image of the, this projection, pre-image of A, that can be thought of as a, what is called a fiber okay, in the total space. So these are all the elements lined up here vertically. We write them vertically like this. 
which are the ones that project down by P onto A, on the, onto a given A. And for each choice of A, there's another fiber. So there's a fiber over A prime, and there's the fiber over A, a double prime. And that was the description we gave last time. So these are kind of two different ways of looking, uh, uh, looking at. Uh, so this is the, the sort, of, sort of fibered viewpoint, okay? And this is a kind of functional viewpoint. To think of it as a kind, a family as a kind of function, a mapping that sends elements of a type to the class of types. And this, you can think of a family of types instead as a special sort of mapping P, which is called a fibration. I won't right now indicate what the exact definition of a fibration is, but you can think of it as this kind of a projection uh, of this style. It's a good uh, rule of thumb, like how, how, to, how to think about it. And then that way, the elements of the particular thing are given by the, are given by the uh, pre-images here. <clears throat> okay, so that's, the, uh, that's the, like the framework that we're working in. And then what we do with this stuff is we close it up. I mean, the reason we're interested in families of types is remember uh, the things we sort of start with, right? So what did we start with? So the types we started with were motivated by logic. So we had one, zero, uh, and, or, or, you know, cross, cross and plus, however you look at it, implication, function space, okay? So if I want to make my notation be reasonably consistent, we can write it like this, okay? So we started out with those things, okay? Then we observed that we could add additional types. There are things that are not motivated by logic, so they would sort of go on this line. So maybe the natural numbers would be one, and, uh, and so on. And then uh, maybe other sorts of uh, types might go in here for, uh, let's just say the natural numbers for the time being. I'll, I'll throw in some other things in a minute, which don't correspond. They don't have a, a logical correspondence. They're, they're merely types. <clears throat> and this is the reason why people kind of think of the whole subject as being really type theory and logic is just a mode of use of type theory, which is Brouwer's dictum that, that uh, uh, about uh, a logic being a branch of mathematics. That's the way he would say it rather than the other way around. Okay, so, uh, so that's, the, that's the idea. And so we started with that basic notion. So now what we want to do is start populating it with other interesting types. And the first ones I'm going to do are going to, well, we looked at little things like sequence. So we'll have various, uh, like sequences of length n, where it's understood from this notation. Somehow I have to indicate that this is ranging over n. And then I could have other things like equalities. We were talking about equalities over the natural numbers. So these are forms of types, okay, that can go in along here. And those can be thought of as, as, as kind of base types, right? They can be thought of as they don't have any further structure. They're just uh, types that I'm building in, like the type of proofs of equations, the type of finite sequences. Okay, maybe this could really be represented uh, in some other way. I'll show how to do that in a minute, but for the moment we'll take that as a, as a primitive notion. We can think of it as a primitive notion. And then what we want to do is have some closure conditions. In other words, the whole reason for getting into this business about having families is to, uh, is to be able to do something with them. And the main thing that we want to do are what are called forming the general product in sum. So what we have here, there are various notations, but uh, pi x and a, b, and I'll write sigma x and a, b. So they're sometimes called pi types, sigma types, they're called product types, sum types, they're called this is sometimes called dependent function type. This is sometimes called dependent product type, which is very confusing because that in certain situations can be called a product, but in other situations that can be called a product and that gets messy, okay? So uh, it's again, there are terminological traditions that collided with one another, okay? Now, special cases of this include, we go back to the logic side here, uh, universal quantification over a type and I'll write here uh, P or something, I'll just write B, okay? And the idea here of existential quantification over a type. But we have to be a little bit careful, okay? These are, these are the kind of logical correspondences, those are correct, but you must be a little bit careful because traditionally, in for, like for example, in first order arithmetic, you consider something much more restrictive than that. We don't consider it over any type. We consider it, for example, in arithmetic, we consider only quantification over the natural numbers. And we fix that. There's a quantifier that is dedicated to that purpose, quantification over the natural numbers. But more generally than one can, can generalize that and consider quantification over other types, A, 
and in particular, it starts to quickly get, gets outside the realm of uh, first order logic or conventional first order logic when we start admitting, for example, function types, because then we can talk about quantification over, uh, over functions, and we can talk about for every f from n to n, and exists an f from n to n, which is outside the realm of what you usually consider in like first order logic. Okay? So they are like the first order quantifiers, but they're not exactly, they're a bit more generalized. But that is the, the, the kind of analogy, and I'll explain why that's a good analogy by telling you what the rules are for, for forming the sigma and the pi. There's going to be another issue about the behavior of existential quantification that will come up here as well uh, that is uh, known to be problematic. So these kind of uh, issue, these kind of correspondences have to be taken somewhat with a grain of salt because there are uh, many complicating issues to be discussed. Okay, so what I want to then do here is to start populating our type theory now, be more serious about it, and formulate what are the principles of forming these so-called dependent types. Now, I'll remind ourselves that we have a bunch of structural principles that sort of come along for free. I won't write down all of them. I've given you uh, references to the literature where you can look up uh, the formal definitions of the type theories and stuff because it would be awfully dreary for me to write out several dozen rules and stuff and everyone would go to sleep. So I'm just going to uh, point out the you know, main things that are important. So, for example, uh, you, can always, you, know, you can always use a variable at its type. Okay, so that's, that's an example of a structural principle, the, the, the use and behavior of variables, okay? The principle of substitution, well, there are more or less general ways to say this, but uh, one version of it is this, it says uh, if x uh, delta gives us, well, now the question is what goes on the right? So I'll cheat here and I'll write a judgment j, and I'll, you'll see what I'm going to do here in a minute. And it says if I have an m which is of type a, then in the instance, remember, these can be sequentially dependent, so I can plug those into delta, and then I can plug that mx in for j. Well, I'm a little cheating here because j stands for any of these judgments, right? So it could be a typing judgment, or it could be a type formation judgment, so I'm using a blackboard economy here to uh, you know, explain these things concisely, but really I mean a bunch of rules here, one for each choice of those judgment j. But this is the principle of substitution. So these are the, the fundamental uh, ideas about variables, right? That a variable is an unknown element of a type, uh, and uh, you can uh, give meaning to variables by substitution, by plugging in for them. That's what variables, what variables are and what they're for. And this is how we do it. <coughs> the principles of functionality say every judgment is going to be functional in those free, in, in its free variables. So here I have to actually write this out. There's no easy way to write this out other than directly. So let's write. Um, uh, let's say n colon b here, and if we have equal elements, oh, I shouldn't have called it m, and well, let me just call them m and m prime, okay, like that, then we're going to want to know, well, there's various things we're going to want to know. Let's look at a specific instance. Let's just look at the last variable. Uh, the technic technicalities are technicalities. Uh, the thing I want to get in here is that m for x n should be equal to uh, m prime for x n in m for x b, excuse me for squeezing, that goes there, uh, and the point being, by a similar rule, which I won't write down, equal instances will give us equal types, so the fact that I chose m for x b here is immaterial because that's going to be definitionally equal to m prime for x b in the way in which we spoke before. Other structural rules come into play, there are rules for weakening, okay, which I won't write out here, we talked about it last time, uh, contraction, exchange. Is substitution something that actually needs to be included as a rule or is it going to be admissible? Well, I'm, I'm assuming I've defined it for all. I haven't really given that definition to you. It's right, right, I mean, but the, the substitution rule you wrote up, is that, does that need to be included as an input rule? Or is that uh, that's what I'm, th so this is what I am not doing, okay? What I'm not doing is committing to some specific formalism. I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to give you the, the semantic principles that are going on. And then for, because of various considerations of meta theory, people formulate it in different ways, is what I was saying before. There are many different formulations, no one of which is right or canonical or best or anything. 
There are just different ways of doing it. So what I'm trying to do for the purpose of teaching is to give you the ideas and I'm not committing to like, this is a rule and that's not a rule and this is admissible and that's not admissible. I'm not going to worry about that because I'm not going to be doing any meta theory. If I were doing some meta theory, then I would have to be very extra careful because I'm trying to cross all my T's and dot my I's. So I'm being a little loose. I, I, I admit that I'm being loose, but there are, there are you know, I'm being uh, faithful to the truth, and I'm, uh, and uh, you can look in the references I've given you for the, you know, various forms of the story. Okay, so we'll have weakening, we'll have contraction, we'll have exchange. I won't bother to write them down as rules, but those should be valid principles in one way or another. Either they're admissible rules or you put them in explicitly, and let's not discuss why you do one or the other. Uh, but let's say we're going to do this. Uh, and then I mentioned last time, amongst many other things, there is the respect for equivalence as well, which says um, definitionally equal types classify the same uh, classify the same terms and etc. Like equal things of this type will be equal at that type and so forth. So I'll just write etc. here because I don't want to. It, it's really too boring to write down every single thing. Okay, so um, that's the flame. But the point I want to say here is that these are the structural principles, right? This is what makes the theory work. Um, this is the generic stuff, and mostly it's about the behavior variables and, and the uh, notion of definitional equality. So in particular, whenever you have an open term, whenever you have some form of like if this is a typing judgment or, or, or it's a type, whenever you have some open judgment here that has some free variables, the rule of thumb is it's a mapping that is functional in those free variables. Okay, that is the idea. Uh, we're worried about the pen. <coughs> I really dislike whiteboards, but you can't teach properly without chalk. Thanks. <coughs> but <laughs> all right. So, uh, so these are the structural principles, and they are primarily about the behavior of variables. That's essentially what is going on. And so, um, <coughs> so we have those. Those are like inherited. Those are for. <clears throat> Those are uh, the context in which we're working because they define for us what we mean by family, okay, this idea of functional dependency. Okay, now the other thing I would like to say is that there's another way of looking at this. It, it's the same thing, but um, you could also look at it this way, which is the, the origin of the notion of type, which goes back to uh, Russell and Whitehead's work, is that a type is the range of significance of a variable. That's another way of looking at it. Okay, whenever you have a variable, you must implicitly or explicitly specify what does it range over. And the thing that it ranges over is called a type. That's the notion of a type. Okay, so in school, uh, way back when, uh, all of the variables ranged over the real numbers. Okay, and nobody ever, I mean, that was clearly specified, but you don't really write it down because everything is tacitly ranging over the real numbers. So here we're going to be, you know, specifying the specifically what the, 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 the range of significance of a, of a variable is. So there's a kind of like general rule of thumb. Whenever you have variables, you have to have types because they, they go together. Uh, it, it is the range of significance of that variable and you must specify its range of significance. So uh, that's why all these things kind of uh, fit together in the way that they do. Okay, uh, good. So that's uh, the, general, uh, the general framework. And now what I would like to do is start, uh, you know, instantiating this a little bit. Okay, so I can say a few things. All right, so let's look at the um, behavior of the quantifiers. And I'm just going to dive in and do them as type constructors, and then I'll draw the analogies to logic uh, on the fly. I could, in fact, continue this whole uh, discussion I was giving you before, but uh, carrying it out in parallel starts to get complicated. So now I'm going to just do like type theory, okay? And then I'll make the analogies to types as uh, to logic. And Steve, I think, will talk about the uh, connections with uh, category theory. The connections to categories are, at this point when you have quantification, start to become more involved. And it's a little hard for me to do that just on the fly. So it'll be nice to set Steve up for doing that. Okay, so let's look at, for example, the product. So this is the, like, in some way where all the, where all the action is. So we are going to, I am, admittedly, I'm starting in the middle. I will piece everything together in due course, but I think it's best to, to, to do it like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, under what conditions is that a type? Well, the conditions under which it's a type are that A is a type, well, really, under which it's a family of types indexed by gamma. 
okay? Because in the induction, that's what we always consider. We only ever consider families. If this happens to be empty, okay, that's fine. Then it's a closed type. Yeah. Uh, it's n there's, nothing I, there's nothing I can do here. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I'm doing my best. You're going with this one for now. Okay. All right. So everything is uh, to be thought of as a family of types indexed by gamma. But we'll carry that along. So A will be a type, well, relative to gamma. So, of course, it's going to be a family of types. And then there's an additional level of variation where we say B has to be a family of types indexed by A. So it will be written like that. Okay, so if you hold the gamma fixed for a moment, like you could think of it as like a currying, uh, instantiate gamma however you like, fix that instance, then uh, that's orange. Yeah, okay, all right. All right, I'll put that in my back pocket. Okay, uh, all right, so you fix the gamma and you say, okay, then what I have is for the fixed gamma I have a type and a family of types indexed by the elements of A. So that's, and this is called the big Cartesian product. So this is called the pi formation rule. A lot of times it's written like that. So if you look at this by analogy, if you think of this now as from the point of view of logic, what I would kind of pencil in here, and maybe that's what orange is good for, what I would pencil in here is this would be a proposition and this would be a proposition. But if you're thinking of it as logic, that would remain being a type. In other words, in conventionally in logic, and uh, what I'm, this is partly where the, it, it's better to do type theory than it is to try to uh, relate everything to logic because in certain, certain, uh, in certain dimensions, logic has, has remained degenerate in ways that it's not when, it, when, it's, when it's presented from the point of view of type theory. And one of those dimensions is, in logic, you don't normally, in you know, conventional textbook logic that you look up, one never considers quantification over propositions because proofs are not mathematical objects. That's completely out of the game. So you have a notion of type, which is your domains of quantification. Okay, and then you can form propositions or predicates over a particular type. And in certain really degenerate forms of logic, there's only one type ever. Okay, maybe it's a type of natural numbers, possibly. There's only one type, but there could be many. If you have, uh, then it's called multi-sorted for some reason. Okay, and then you have a notion of a proposition indexed by that type. But in the context of type theory, we just say, oh, props, types, you know, that's just like uh, a matter of your point of view. Okay, there's no real difference between a proposition and a type. They're the same thing. So that has some consequences. It means in particular that the thing we're quantifying over could very well look more like a proposition, really. Okay, I mean, it's a matter of how you look at it, of course, but it would, could have the form, you know, involving only logical connectives, and then it looks like you're quantifying over proofs. And the reason being, proofs are mathematical objects, just like all the others. Types classify all the mathematical objects, and that's what we quantify over. So, and passant, we get proof quantification over proofs. So it all sort of works out smoothly. Uh, the conventional story is a bit, thanks, the conventional story is a bit, uh, is a bit um, uh, contrived when you see it from a, a type theoretic point of view because type theory was the first sort of comprehensive understanding of logic in my, in my opinion. Okay. So, okay, but that's what it would look like and then you would tend to write, if it were a logic book, then you would tend to write this as for all. So you would make the distinction that that's a type, this is a proposition and then you'd write that as a for all. Okay, so that's a special case of, uh, of the general thing. All right, and then continuing in the pattern of natural deduction then, we have to decide what are the elements of this type. So let's look at the introduction. All right, so let's think about this. So I want to say something or other is an element of this type. <clears throat> I'm also going to have to say equality and stuff, but I'll, I'll get to that. Pi X and AB, okay. So if you just think of your um, uh, set theoretic experience, then if I uh, look at you may well have seen, I'll jot it up here on the side, the idea of pi x in a b of x, where this is a family of types indexed by a. That's what we're, what we're describing. And this is variously described as being uh, an infinitary <coughs> sequences, like that is a indexed element, so it's basically uh, B sub A, B sub A prime, oops, uh, B sub A double prime, et cetera, for each uh, possible choice of A prime. So people sometimes write it like that. Or there are various ways you can notate it. Okay, well, really what's going on is it's a function, it's a mapping that assigns to every element of here an element of the corresponding instance here. 
So the way we're going to write that is says, well, given an element of the domain of quantification, I expect you to give me, and let me a little, put a little x here just to indicate, a, a variable element of the variable type. Okay, so this is an element that knows about x, and this is a type that knows about x, okay? And then the idea is, what you're saying here is, this is a mapping, right? This is a mapping that assigns to each, x, each element little a in a, it signs m sub a, uh, which is of type b sub a. And the collection of all of those forms, uh, 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 if I put those all together, that will give me an element here, and that's a lambda abstraction. So this will be written lambda x a. If I wanted to emphasize, I could write m sub x. Okay, and then in that case, I would write b sub x, and it would look like that. So that's uh, the pi introduction rule. So the point is it's a function, and this could also be notated send x in a to m sub x. You could write it like that. Or you could write it as, you know, angle brackets m sub x sub x in a. I mean, there are various ways of, like, people notate it. But computer scientists use lambda, of course. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll write down, we'll write it using a lambda. Okay, so that's the introductory form. And then the elimination form, and this is a characteristic thing. <coughs> yep. Everything written where now? You're on the top of the board. At the top of the lower board? Yeah, so what I was trying to do is I was trying to say, I was trying to give us a little chart. We could write this in two columns if we want, two rows if we want. So I had, we started out with various propositions, and then we, we drew analogies between those propositions and types, and then we got carried away and started writing down a lot of types that didn't correspond to proposition, and then they kind of do again in the, in the way that I have been explaining. That's not, the, the correspondences to traditional things are not exact, because traditional things are weirdly incomplete from the point of view of uh, type theory. Did that answer your question? As, as one what? Because they're not. I mean, because certain types do not correspond to propositions, and certain accounts of propositions, like you find in books, are only fragments of the types. Oh, why do I use that notation, you're saying? Uh, well, uh, as I say, because the quantifiers that all in the exist, um, it's, a it's a notational tradition. I mean, it's a basic thing I can tell you. I, I want to emphasize the idea, the constructive content of propositions as being, a proposition is nothing other than the type of a bunch of proofs. And so by writing it in this kind of notation of pi and sigma, stresses the, the idea that it's a construction. Is they? Uh, yes. Okay, I, I don't know uh, what, what, what further, how much further I can, I can take it. No, it's, you know, there are, as I've mentioned, there's a collision of terminology and notations that ever Risen, risen over, you know, century or more, and I'm trying to make clear the correspondences, but what I really care about in my heart of hearts is type theory, and so I'm writing down, you know, type theory and then trying to draw the analogies as much as I can. That's the best I can do for you. It's, there are, th th believe me, there are some really horrendous notational uh, collisions that you'll run into that can be very confusing. Okay, what now? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Okay, that seems to work. Okay, so uh, so yeah, that's that's the well, that's the best. I mean, if it's not helpful, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to be helpful. So <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay, so going on, we want to look at the elimination forms. So we want to say, what do we do with an element of this? If I have an element of pi x and a b, what do you do with that guy? Well, remember, it's to be thought of as 
perhaps as a function or an infinite sequence or uh, whatever, whichever of these kind of notations you like to think. So what I can do is I can instantiate it. And by instantiating it, I instantiate it at a particular element of its domain. So what I do is I say, if you give me a particular element of the domain, then, OK, I need a notation. And typically, it's just application that you take the nth element, as it were, of the sequence m. That's a way to think about it. Or you can think of it as applying the function m to the argument n. Uh, it doesn't matter. And what you get back is a corresponding instance of that family. And this is the critical, critical idea here that, that goes on, is the fact that when you choose from this sequence a particular thing, n, and you plug that in, the thing you get is in that fiber. Okay, so it's here. That's where, where this belongs. And that's a characteristic, uh, characteristic feature. And then if we look again at those principles of definitional equality that I talked about so far, then we will get the, the, the baseline understanding, you recall, is the idea of uh, computation, these beta-like rules, which are representing what Frank, I think, probably called the inversion principle, the idea that the elimination rules invert the introduction rules. So it says, if I take something which I have explicitly introduced, so let's write it like that, and I then eliminate it, do it in application, that should be the same as just plugging in, in this case, n for x in M, and its type will be n for x in B, under suitable premises like uh, A is a type and uh, M is a family of elements of the family of types B, okay, like that. And this is the sort of beta-like rule, and this is, can also be called pi computation, if you will. All right, so that's, uh, that's like one of the basic principles of definitional equivalence. Now, I know that it has come up in Frank's uh, discussion whether there should be other principles of definitional equality. And for the time being, I'm just not going to go there, okay? There is some, I said to you before, the exact idea of what is definitional equality is a little bit up for grabs. It's not completely clear. Uh, I think that uh, Frank might have postulated for you a different rule, which I won't officially take because I have other ways of dealing with this, but one might consider as well, I'll just put a question mark, uh, a rule that says, uh, the other way around. This is the local soundness, so it's what Frank calls a local completeness. So if you put the, the intro after the elim, that that somehow should also be uh, a no-op, right? That those should cancel. And I'll just leave that. That's called the Eda rule. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will leave that aside for the time being. I certainly demand, at, at a minimum,